Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this week on another episode of Detection Challenging Paradigms, the podcast powered by SpectreOps. Our special guest this week is joining us from Dublin, Ireland, with a pretty extensive background within security. This guest has been involved in security for more than 10 years, where he has worked in fields such as forensics, detections, investigation, and response, and has become an expert in security operations as a whole. His passion for automated solutions has led him to co-find a company called Times. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Thomas. Within this episode, our conversations with Thomas circulated around topics like how did Tynes come to existence and why he thought there was a need to create Tynes. How does Tynes help the detection and response process? The importance of enriching data from a detection, investigation, response perspective. How to classify data sets from malware scores on binaries versus techniques to how to classify a false positive, when we should classify a false positive, and if that false positive should be classified as globally unique. Also, we talked about how important it is to dive deeper into the telemetry you currently have instead of continuously wanting to buy different solutions. We talked about many other great things within this episode, and we hope you enjoy. Luke, you know what to do, man. Roll that intro. Hey, Thomas, thanks for joining us today, man. How you been? Pretty great. Thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Absolutely. For our audience, would you mind uh, giving like a background of how you got into InfoSec and kind of like what you're up to day to day now? Yeah, sure. So I'm Thomas, uh, one of the founders of Times. I spent about 10 years working in information security before uh, creating an automation company with uh, with one of my old colleagues. Um, I got into information security, I started late in, in consulting in information security uh, around e-discovery forensics. Um, and some fraud in Deloitte for a little over a year. And um, started that because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I really liked information security, but I didn't really know like what area or what um, kind of part I wanted to get into. Um, that was really interesting, exposed me to a lot of like very smart people, uh, taught me the right way to do things, the wrong way to do things, uh, and taught me that actually working in industry is sometimes a little bit better than working in consulting, and sometimes consulting is better than working in industry. Um, but I was there for about a year, uh, working ridiculously long hours, and got an opportunity to move into eBay, uh, where I joined their technical investigations team. This is at a time, and I'm sure we'll get into this later, this is at a time when eBay and PayPal, or eBay owned PayPal, and eBay and PayPal were like the number uh, two and number one fished brands in the world and like in terms of carding in terms of uh, like malware paypal and ebay were just targeted all the time so it's a really really interesting place to work my job is on like the fraud uh and technical investigations team where we were trying to detect large criminal organizations like ato and tens of thousands of accounts uh and like exiting money uh and then working with law enforcement for attribution and prosecution so a really really uh really really interesting area um after that, moved into DocuSign for a couple of years before I started their security operations team. Um, so grew that team from the two, well, myself, my co-founder, own uh, the two of us to about 30 people globally and responsible for, at the end, ultimately nearly everything uh, on the security side of the house that's not compliance. Uh, we didn't run AppSec, but it was like security infrastructure, um, incident response, e-discovery, threat intelligence, fraud, detections. Uh, and it was really while we were there that we kind of felt the need for a platform like Tynes. I'll talk about Tynes in a, I'm sure, in a little bit as well. Um, but yeah, same as every security team out there, we were just like slammed with alerts. We were getting budget, but unable to uh, like purchase all the tools we wanted, unable to hire everybody that we needed to hire and just realized that it was just too hard to keep on top of everything. So we decided to um, invest in automation. We looked at all the automation platforms out there, didn't really like what we saw. So decided to go out and create a security automation company to solve the problems that we thought that other companies should have been solving. And so been uh, the company's three years old last month. Uh, and yeah, we're growing pretty fast and it's uh, it's an exciting area to be in. And um, right now I like, like as if in every startup do a little bit of everything, but mostly in charge of like customer success. Uh, so working with all of our customers during like proof of value uh, or proof of concept uh experimentations with times uh and then 
once they become a customer, just working with them day to day. So we've got some incredible customers like so of like Coinbase or um yeah, McKesson, Bank of Ireland, people like that, uh, who are doing some box.com, who are doing some really, really smart stuff. Uh, so it's like really learning what they're doing and then helping helping make their security teams, their incident response teams more successful and able to like help them focus on the most important uh, most important part of building new detections rather than like analyzing tens of thousands of alerts. Cool. What type of services does Tynes like offer to clients? <laughs> Uh, so we're a platform rather than like services. So we enable security teams to automate their repetitive manual tasks. So we're a so, uh, in that sore bucket um, with, uh, with yeah, lots of like, lots of really, uh, really impressive players. Um, but our customers will use the platform. We'll have like playbooks that will say, hey, here's a good example of a, of a playbook for handling a phishing email or handling an EDR alert or handling uh, a suspicious login alert or for like onboarding or offboarding users or something like that. But ultimately as a platform, we enable the end user and specifically like the analysts uh, or the engineers. So you don't actually have to be like a software developer. Uh, we enable them to define their own playbooks really, really easily and kind of a drag and drop method. Um, so we'll help you, but for the most part, like once you learn how to use the platform, which is really, really simple, uh, it's going to be the customers uh, themselves that are building out their playbooks to suit their own needs. Because the, the needs of one company are completely different than the needs of another company. Uh, we can give you a really good example and say like, this is, you know, both zeros guard duty playbook, but that's absolutely not going to work for a company that doesn't have the sophistication level of both zero or has slightly different requirements to uh, like on their response. Cool. Whenever you guys talk about playbooks, <clears throat> excuse me, could you like define what really that means in your guys' definition? Because I mean, we've had we've had clients that playbooks mean something different than run books and depending on if it's manual or if it's automated or if it's a hybrid between the two. Can you kind of like walk me through that process that you guys have? Yeah, great. So we so I use play, the term playbook like generically there, like a playbook I'd probably consider like every part of like from that detection to the response to the communication ep, uh, effort. What in times you're only building the automated parts of that. And that's not going to be every single part, but it's the automated part of like maybe receiving that alert from your SIM. So send it to a webhook or you can pull. Uh, and then it's building out those uh, those next steps of either like creating tickets, enriching uh, with information from other sources, contacting users, um, and maybe like performing actions like isolating a host, carving a file, uh, dumping memory, like making a repo private, all that sort of stuff. All of that can be encompassed in a playbook, be, uh, or but what, that's what we'll call really an automation story. So the automation stories are those processes in times that you build. Cool. Yeah, um, I haven't had a chance to, to play with um, times that much yet. Um, but it's definitely on my backlog of things to do this week and next week. So I'm actually pretty excited. Somebody from your team actually reached out to me on LinkedIn because I joined you guys as Slack. And they were like, hey, is this you? I was like, yeah, yeah, for sure it is. So I'm I'm definitely excited to play with it because I like to, to kind of deal with things. There was a while back, Jared and I, um, we found a big need um, or maybe a desire that we had that a lot of, um, and you've probably seen this as well, but a lot of products just don't meet the requirement of what we want to really do. For example, one thing um, I know, like people, a lot of people, a lot of companies use Splunk, for example, right? Um, uh, their data model is different than their sister product of Phantom, right? So you, whenever you build out those playbooks, you want to deal with data, you have to do some enrichment and change things around that way. Um, and there's just some capabilities in there that I really wish we could have built out. So eventually, like Jared and I were like, let's just do this ourselves. Um, and like the solution that we came up with is definitely not a organizational kind of scalable use case, I would say. It was more like a, just a POC inside of Jupyter Notebooks and just a lot of Python blobs of code. Uh, but it, that's just one thing that we've, we've noticed quite a bit is how do you take a detection, right? And also like define a detection, like what is that base condition? So what's the bare minimum that needs to be met in order for that to be pushed into something like say triage, right? And really break, and it sounds like you guys identify this as well, is breaking apart the different pieces of the pipeline within the detection response section, right? And automating what you can, but then identifying what really needs to be manual. For example, like we talk about this a lot is you have a detection, right? So that's gonna be like the base condition, the bare minimum that an attacker needs to perform in order for the attack to be performed correctly or the action to be performed. And then how can we pull that um, once that alert fires, that quote unquote alert or that event or data set we haven't really like defined whether or not we like the term alert when that happens. It, what more if it's just a data set or not? Because it's like what really defines an alert. It's like kind of it's it's difficult, right? So it's like is an alert really just something you pass over to an analyst at that point? It's like okay, I want you to take a look at this, 
or like what really defines that, right? So then it's like you take that data set and then you want to add contextual pieces as times goes on, right? And then that can just add either severity based off like a mathematical equation of like what's important. But like, then again, like, I don't know if we've come up with a great solution of the mathematical equation there either. Um, Cause it's, it's very like subjective, I think when it comes to that. Um, but then that triage piece, in my opinion, can be automated. Um, that data can be pulled and all that, those pieces be added back to the original data set. But however, whenever you pass that into a quote unquote investigation, then you pass off that quote unquote alert to the analyst say, hey, like this is sitting here. The high priorities are sitting here. Man, that's another thing. It's like you have like the high severity that you want to send out, but then oftentimes in environments, they might have a low alert or an informational alert that happens. They're like, well, I don't know if we really want to see this. And we've had a client that's like, we might just want to like throw away the low alerts. Well, so we want to keep those somewhere, store them somewhere and just do a priority list and like maybe have them stored separately, like the low but informational on S3 where you still are alerted on those and you go look at them, but then like the priority should be the high and medium alerts at the time. So you don't get like alert fatigue over time. Um, but yeah, so it sounds like you guys deal with this on a day to day, which makes me very interested to play with times because I mean, again, my POC is not scalable. It sounds like yours very, very much is. <laughs> yeah. And like the, 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 there's, there's tons of challenges with, uh, with some of the other automation platforms like phantom. It's, it's not just that the data model is, is hard. It's not like all of your detections and all, a lot of your response, a lot of the, like the playbooks there are, they are going to be written in Python, which means that like to understand them, you're going to have to understand what, you know, Jared or Johnny wrote as like, you know, var variable one is X and like you build that data model. It's just not, it's just not easy to understand, but yeah, you're a hundred percent right. Like I, we, we don't like we're, I'm, I'm a security engineer by heart. Like my, my, um, uh, I don't believe that times should be shoehorned into every single process. And I don't believe that I can solve every single problem. We're also just focused on that automation piece. So we're not trying to be your case management or anything else. Um, but what we do believe is that like in information security, there's so many things that could be really, really like, they're not necessarily high fidelity detections. They are those alerts. But if you, uh, like you're missing a huge amount of detections by saying that, oh, like we just can't do this because it's going to be like low, so, like uh, it's going to like, if there's going to be a high, uh, a high false positive rate or that it just takes too much time to gather all this information and put it in front of an analyst. Uh, I'll disagree with your uh, throwing away low alerts, but I'll talk about that later. But like what, what we think in times is that when you're building these detections, there's a lot of information that you can gather. And I think you talked about this with Andrew uh, from, from Gray Noise. There's a huge amount of information you can gather from other sources that will like define whether this is true or false. And for any alert, like once it's generated, the manual steps of triage are really like, you're kind of doing one of two things. You're either gathering more information or you're saying, oh, this actually like needs an analyst to make a decision. And if you're gathering more information, literally every single one of those steps could be automated. And yep. it doesn't matter like what, it doesn't matter what that step is. Like it's it, sometimes obviously you won't have the tools, but if it's like a suspicious login, you can investigate that IP address in like manually, you do it in one or two automated. You can do it in 20 or 50 different sources and then say, hey, here's your score. Here's all that information that you have or all that information that you need. And um, but you can also enrich it against like your own internal data sets and like deduplicate against your own internal data sets. Like, hey, has uh you know Luke logged in on this IP address before? Is he in this country? Is he on holidays? Um, like, you know, where else have we seen this IP like where else have we seen this IP address in our data set? Like, is Luke's endpoint actually like on this IP address as well? Because if it is, then I probably don't care as much unless somebody's stolen Luke's computer and gone to Egypt. Um and like on top of that, then like even yet yeah, the other the other like pieces of context that you might want around like you know whether this file was bad like if you want you can go as far as like automating file carving pulling that back out throwing it into a sandbox like every single step that an analyst might take before they make a decision you can uh, you can automate and the best part about it is that like you can then just like put all of that information into a really rich ticket and then the analyst is able to make that decision and say oh wow this is actually really bad or oh that's this is really good and i think that um yeah, it's just it's exciting when people are building out building out these like these uh these stories as well. Because they don't realize just how like in depth their manual process is when they're responding to alerts. That you'll ask them a question and 
like you'll say, hey, like, how do you respond to this manually? And it's like, oh, I investigated in this, like, you know, this tool over here, maybe it's virus total. But like, and if it's, you know, uh, you know, if it's adware, they're like, oh, you know, maybe I need to like do this process over here. It's like, and what if it's the CEO's machine? It's like, oh, well, then I'm like, absolutely, you know, like dropping everything, even if it's just adware. And you're like, okay, but like, these are all steps that you can, yeah, these are all steps that you can automate really, really easily. I, I find so, uh, one thing that I, that I think is interesting that you talked about is uh, when somebody, I find that a lot of analysts have a really hard time uh, describing in specific steps what investigation means. So there's this uh, like childhood psychology psychologist named Jean Piaget from from France um, that had this really like he he kind of has like the fundamental or like the uh, the ultimate like kind of perspective on how like childhood's psychology like how a child develops from like thought. And one of the things that he used to talk about was the idea that uh, as an as an adult, if you have a child um, and they're let's say they're two years old, so they could communicate, you you might not be able to say clean your room to them and get the response that you're expecting because clean your room is an abstraction, right? Of of specific steps that you want them to do, and so like a lot of times parents might say something like clean your room to their child, and then they come back and it's not the room's not cleaned the way that they expected it to be, um, and so like he's kind of like well it'd be you know when you start off you say hey, I want you to clean your room. And in order to do that, you have to take your teddy bear, which is a very specific object, and put it on the shelf. Well, they know what a teddy bear is and they know what a shelf is, but they don't necessarily know what all goes into clean your room. And so you might have to like be very specific. And uh, I find that like as we become adults, you uh, you kind of run into situations, especially in like InfoSec, where somebody might say, uh, I don't know how to describe bad, but I know when I'll see it. Or, uh, you know, I, I just use my experience to be able to run an investigation. But if you try to ask them to break it down, uh, they have a hard time, um, which then creates a little bit of like a barrier to success with with like SOAR products, I imagine, because you're really asking people to break down their process specifically. And I think it's like we, we have uh, a tendency to build our process implicitly, right? So like you kind of like just, you, you don't actually explicitly come up with like, these are the steps that my playbook should have. It's just kind of like, oh, well, I do some stuff that's just kind of a conglomeration of my experience um, that doesn't necessarily have as much rhyme or reason as as you might expect. Do you do you find that like you run into that scenario with clients often to where like they they kind of like know at a high level what the task is that they want to automate it, automate, but they don't necessarily know what the steps are uh, to put together to actually achieve that objective? Like, yeah, of course. And like, it's kind of the, uh, like people don't understand all those steps that they take, like, the, like implicitly, but it's the same as like, you know, sometimes like rubber ducking, uh, you know, when you're developing software, like having a conversation with somebody, you will like tease some of those out, but it's even better when you're like actually manually taking those or you're, you're automating each of those steps individually. So in times we, like, if, you, if you've got an action in uh, like, you know, analyzing a phishing email, you'll break down your process into 10 actions. In times you just translate those manual actions into uh, one of our seven atomic actions in times. And um, what you'll find though, is that like these, like the stories that you're building, they're like living, like they're living uh, stories and they're living documentation for what your processes are. And it's not so much that like people will have a problem like breaking it down, they'll have a problem explaining it. But what you'll find is that they'll like they'll have automated like 10 steps and then like it, it could be uh, analyzing a file and like uploading the analysis to uh uploading the analysis to to your case management system or something like that. And then their next step that they'll have, they'll be like, Oh yeah, like I'm not really sure. I think we need to like, you know, this uh we need to like extract out the like the macro from this uh from this document. It's like okay like that's that's a solid next step that you performed manually when like after this automation is run they can then say here's like here are the steps that are required in order to automate that process but it's kind of when you hand off that alert to somebody what we'll find is like the steps that they'll do manually once they've done that two or three times they're like i'm sick of this like i don't want to have to do this manually times can do this uh, or another automation platform can do this and when the other automation platform does this like they're like oh, actually that's like that's something that i don't need to do anymore so we'll find that like what what is initially like maybe you know you're six months in a customer has like a, a process that's like 100 steps like 12 months in, it's probably 130, 140 steps. And two years in, it's 200 steps. 
maybe they'll have like reformatted it at that point because they're like actually this is a repeatable process that I like use all the time over here. So I need to like to jig it around a little bit. But yeah, we will find that as you think about it a little bit more, you will be able to like plug those gaps in your process. And ultimately like that that process of like I implicitly know what's good, that's not a that's not something that any like it's something that an analyst can like say and if they're a good analyst, you're like, yeah, I kind of trust you. But like as a security leader, if somebody says, I implicitly know that's good or I implicitly know that's bad or I lose, I use my spidey senses, yep. you should be like, that's actually, that's probably not the correct way of doing it. And if you like, if you told that to like your compliance folks, like what, what, like, you know, what's part of your process? And you said like to your, I don't know, like a anybody else, they'd be like, mm, I'm not sure that's, that, that's how you should be at. That's how you should be building your security yep. program, like relying on spidey senses. 100%. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. This is, you kind of reminded me of an interesting thing. So Johnny was talking about the scoring thing, right? So like yeah. uh, we do, I, I think like the industry has a pretty good idea of like, or there's been a lot of effort to try to score binaries, for instance, right? So like uh, give me a, you know, a, a portable executable file and I'll tell you whether or not uh, I think it's, it, you know, I'll give you a malware score or whatever. Um, and I think there's a lot of effort into that, but like, what if, what if we were looking at say like service creation, can we create uh, a score for each service that says the likelihood that it's malicious? Right. And like there, like right now we'd be making that up based off of our like arbitrary experience, but our experience is limited in concept, right? Because we haven't seen every potential malicious service out there. Right. So we're, we're working off of like a limited experience set. Um, but what if we, then I was thinking, okay, well, what if we just like created this gigantic corpus of uh of services to where we collected you know millions of services that are just arbitrarily created at customer sites that you know whatever everybody could contribute to this um and then and then we went through and s saw like you know what do all these services have in common uh what are like the kind of anomalous features of it um you know you start to kind of pull out things that are common among services maybe those aren't quite as important or indicative of anything things that are anomalous can be used to identify good or bad but then you also need the ability to go through and determine this service is in fact bad like as part of your model right when you're building out the score you need to say you need to go through each service and say bad good bad good manually right so that then when you start to pull out anomalous features uh you could say this anomalous feature is only present in bad services and that means that that anomalous feature should increase the score or this anomalous feature is only present in good good services um and so that should lower the score or you know keep the score the same whatever it is um but then it brought up this idea of like, well, there's probably inherent flaws in our ability to classify even manually um, services being good or bad, right? So like in some theory, like, you know, uh, a naive, you know, single single variable type univariate type to, uh, automated classification is probably uh, error prone. But even ma like a manual uh, analysis or classification is is extremely error prone. So like if if I looked at 10 services and Johnny looked at 10 services, A, like first of all, what does malicious even mean? Right. So like that that's all dependent upon, you know, scenario, risk, all kinds of stuff. But B, we probably wouldn't classify all 10 of them to be we wouldn't classify them the same. And so there's like an inherent issue uh, kind of built in. And I like it kind of reminded me like what you were talking about kind of reminded me of uh, I was thinking about doing this cert like this survey to where you present uh, survey, you know, respondents with with a series of like, you know, services or Kerberos tickets or whatever the thing is that you're trying to do. And you evaluate uh, like manually how accurate people are at classifying things. Right. So like you give them some subset of context around the event. And you say, hey, based on what you have, tell me whether you think this is good or bad. And I think like I'd be really interested in the outcome of that because I think your your results would vary very significantly. Right. So like, it'd be huge variance uh, between results. And it's, it's kind of interesting of like, what does that actually say? Does that just say that we shouldn't trust manual analysis or does it say that, you know, there are uh, different levels of experience which make people, you know, better at using spidey senses or can we actually like glean what those spidey senses are in a tangible way to actually be able to uh, apply that to some automation routine going forward. Yeah, like really interesting. There's a ton of there's a ton of stuff to 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 unpack there. Like sure, the, like oh, 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 like 
it, as you say, like it's going to depend massively on the context, and it's going to depend massively on the like the experience of the people that are analyzing and what their history is and like what they've been bit with before. To be honest, there's a great um, there's a great phrase in like just military history that's you know generals are always fighting the last war that they lost, uh, and you know it's you know why the French like built the Maginot Line so that the Germans wouldn't be able to like you know invade France and of course the Germans just go around them and go into uh go in through Belgium but like it's the same in information security like when you are investigating something your top priority is like I'm not going to get hit by like XYZ again like I'm like I'm going to be able to defend against that or I'm not going to get um like, yeah I'm super familiar with like these three types of attacks that I've seen before uh so therefore this these are the things that I'm going to be looking out for but like you may not have any familiarity with like like yeah with kerber roasting or something like that where you're like i actually just haven't like seen that like in an attack against me before so therefore i'm not particularly worried about it mm -hmm. and like that looks completely normal to me so i'll classify that service as fine and it's yeah it's an it's it's a it's an inherent flaw but it, it, it kind of points to yeah like it points to i suppose the the training that a lot of people get um and the yeah like the the way we build detections right now which is like focused on yeah it, it, like it, it's focused on like hey these are some of the attack techniques that we need to that we need to like that we need to do rather than like uh, or we need to detect rather than focusing on like yeah your risk profile what you guys should like what you as a company should be uh should be worried about and yeah what's like terrifying for your organization and what's really bad for your organization and uh, i wonder if there's there's also even a concept of like so a factor let's uh, just to make sure everybody knows what i'm talking about when i say a factor that means like some tidbit of information right so like if we're talking about kerberos tickets a factor might be the service account that the that kerberos ticket is for right or a factor might be the uh, encryption type of the ticket right those are like the different factors right mm -hmm. and uh i'm it would be interesting and like a lot of times a single event does not give you all the factors that would be relevant which is why we talk about enrichment right or correlation would be uh i don't know if like in your parlance these are the these two things are the same or if they're differentiated correlation in my mind is i have two events and i'm able to combine them together to get more context and then enrichment is yeah. i'm able to go out to some third party source and pull additional information so like maybe i reach out to virus total to get uh like signature information about a binary or something like that is that would you yep. say that's an accurate yeah that's exactly that's exactly correct yeah. okay yeah and so like then the question is is uh are we able to then use that type of like manual analysis kind of like uh survey to determine uh when you start getting like uh, uh what's the word when like the next one isn't worth as much as the previous one diminishing, diminishing returns. margin returns, yeah, yeah yeah so like basically like is there a point at which we have like extremely diminishing marginal returns for the next factor, right? So like basically there's no point in getting, the, I don't think this is true in curb roasting, but there would be no value in, in correlating like the, uh, the encryption type of the curb roast ticket because that doesn't actually help anybody become more accurate in their analysis of whether or not that ticket is malicious. But that, that could be like a really kind of valuable insight to have is, uh, you know, what are like kind of the minimum factors that I need to reach some acceptable level of analysis? And then like, at what point do I have so much that it's not even worth gathering additional information? Yeah, what I think yeah, inter sorry, what sorry, I think's Kevin. interesting about that, Jared, is um, you're talking about the encryption type with the Kerberos tickets. And it's like, for example, how many times have we seen in within detections, they want to look for only RC4 format, right, of the ticket? Well, historically speaking, that might be something an attacker would be requesting for more versus like AES, right? But that doesn't mean it always has to be that way. Um, and I think sometimes as detection engineers or analysts, we get so stuck in the historical events of what has been most common. And instead of being more forward thinking in the what's the real possibilities. And it's okay to look at the historic like information and use that as like, okay, well, if I do see one in RC4, maybe because historically that might be more interesting for me to look into as of right now, but that shouldn't be that shouldn't change my priority of the ticket per se based off the data in that in that aspect in my opinion yeah well yeah so like in that case there's a practical reason right so rc4 is a less expensive algorithm than aes 256 and so it's easier to brute force an rc4 ticket uh than it would be to do an aes 256 that doesn't mean it's like if you have a sufficiently simple password like if your password is abc 
um, then it's going to be very like it doesn't matter that AES two fifty six is a more complex algorithm because you're going to brute force it relatively quickly, right? So um, it just but like if you're trying to go for like the lowest hanging fruit, then RC four is what you go for. But then like that goes back to if you're an, an analyst that doesn't actually understand how curb roasting works and you just read online that like, you know, curb roasting often requests RC4 tickets and now you've hard coded that you will only alert on RC4 tickets, you've created a blind spot, yeah. right? Or an opportunity for false negatives as I, as I would call it. Um, because that's not necessarily a requirement. It's just, you know, probably the, the standard practice, I guess. But Thomas, you, I think, I think you had something you were going to add to the yeah. previous point. Uh, no, I guess it would like I, 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 it was more just like gathering all that contextual information that what you don't want to do is like supplement alert overload with information overload when somebody doesn't have that context and doesn't know about that. Mm -hmm. That like ideally with your tickets and with your detections, uh, you should be like providing as much documentation as possible to say like, hey, here's all the context that's necessary. And sometimes you can automate certain responses and like you know, hey, we need to like isolate this host or lock this account. But realistically, you should be, you know, providing an analyst with like, hey, here's the three or four different pieces of information that you should be looking for afterwards, yeah. or here's the decision that you should be making. And you, yeah, there's, it's not just a point that like, yeah, with automation, you can gather all this information uh, or you can correlate to, uh, or enrich with all, yeah, correlate to all these other events or enrich with all this, um, this data. You just have to be careful that like, you're not just presenting an analyst with, spaghetti where they're like i just have no idea what's going on especially for your sock analysts who are like a little bit more junior who are on the front line who are you know seeing something for the very first time i think that's even more true if you're more advanced te techniques uh, and i i think it'd be worth like talking about some of that later around like the the level of detection that a lot of people are talking about it's just like it's extremely advanced but like a lot of the stuff that people are seeing is just so you know yeah, like, it, you know, there, it's, it is like adware or it is like somebody clicking on a link that, you know, they're the ones that they're familiar with. So when they see something that's more complicated, they can just get completely lost. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. So they're like, basically what you're saying is like, um, just because it's like with automation, you could almost say that it's free to gather that additional factor, yeah. right? But like that, just because it's free to gather, it doesn't mean that you should gather it is kind of the point that I think you and I are both getting at is like, just because it's available and you know free or automated doesn't mean that it's worthwhile, right? Because that could actually, like the process of automating the correlation of that could cause the like, ultimately there's a decision that has to be made. It can make the decision harder to make in the future, yeah, uh, like going down the road. Exactly, and also like there's a thousand detections that you can be building and like I guarantee you there's like, not a single organization in the world that has like you know the backlog of detections they want to build done like at some point you should be like ah okay like let's move on to the next detection and like tune that a little bit better yeah or let's see can we like go further up or further down the kill chain and uh and build some uh build some detections there sure so yeah i think the thing that i really like about the automation aspect is not only does it make life easier for the analyst per se but what i think also is it helps us to identify maybe the gaps in our process that we currently have Right. And I think that's what's I think that's super important as well Is it's a learning aspect, because I think you could have someone who's been in industry for 10 years and they're continuously learning. I mean, that's what's awesome about InfoSec, right? Is you're continuously learning um, and there's always a new perspective to have on a specific process. Right. And so I think whenever you automate something that's typically just going to be your automated manual process. Right. So what you are used to doing day to day. And now you can go back and look at that and say, I think I would like to add this. And then you have maybe a junior analyst come in and say, how would you investigate X? I was like, okay, let me show you my playbook. And it's like, this is like, these are the things that are automated. These things I have to go like look at manually because I want to make a decision on the data. And then you walk through that process, which I think is, which I think is really cool in that aspect, um, which ultimately is going to help our process over time be better and be more efficient, in my opinion. Like, 100 percent it like it skills people up it skills people up like enormously and gets them over that uh over that hump and they can they can walk through like the logic before like for all those detections and it's a lot easier to walk through like a visual playbook um where you're able to say like hey like it was at this point that we saw the virus total score was four so we didn't care or we saw that like this contained you know a hack tool so therefore i was like you know freaked out like it's at that when somebody's looking through that they're able to understand what that decision is as opposed to if you've made the decision a little bit further on in the 
sorry, a little bit earlier to not show that, uh, like it's coming from your sim or something like that. Like it's a lot harder for the analyst to be like, look, I've got, you know, a hundred thousand events and I picked out these 50 or these a hundred. Like, yeah. why did you dump those other like 99,500? Like, I don't know why you like yep. why, why why we didn't, but I do know that at this point this is where it uh, this is where it stopped. It's really uh it's really useful for for them to them to skill up. It's still, however, super important that the analyst does get that experience, like investigating that manually and following that process manually as well, though. Because what you don't want to do is you don't want to like say, hey, we've actually automated. Like it's it's great to you and you should you know have completely automated the process all the way down to if you can you know isolating the host or like yeah you know blocking a domain or something like that. But it's important that the analyst gets that like is able to play with that malware and see it and like understand all those processes themselves uh because otherwise they're just not like they're going to rely on automation a little bit too much uh and you don't yeah. want that to happen either you want them to you want them to experience it you want them to like to understand the like the the first level uh yeah. and be be like be playing with phishing emails be playing with malware in sandboxes be like figuring out what malware actually looks like when it's like you know detected by your ed or you want all of that to happen as well yeah, I think one of the biggest pet peeves that I have typically in industry is whenever like I want to learn something, right? And then I just get hit with the, it takes time. And so the reason why I don't like that is because typically there's a process there. It's just you might not remember the exact process that you walk through to go to do that. And I think whenever it comes to like an automation piece, um, you are forced to take a step out of your shoes and say, okay, how am I actually doing this? And then you have to judge that process, which might be uncomfortable for many people. Right. Because it's like, OK, well, you might want to look at you might want to look at X instead of Y or and that's just different perspective that's added on to that. Like whenever Jared and I first walked through the whole automation, automating all that inside of Jupyter Notebooks, um, we first walked through, OK, how do we take this uh, this data set and start to add contextual pieces? Let's let's like manually walk through it. I mean, look at every data event on the host, everything we would like to see and really struggle bus it so that we really appreciate that automation piece in the future. Um, which is really could be used as a guide um, moving forward to either teaching or whenever you want to correlate that. And the cool thing is if a new aspect of the attack comes out or a new research piece comes out and you can then look at the process as, am I actually covering this already? If not, I can add that back into the process instead of saying, okay, now I have to wait for the alert to fire to see if I actually manually do this myself and make a note of it. Right. And so I think there's just a lot of things mentally that happen there. That it's almost like a lot of logical leaps mentally that happen between the, the steps and processes that I think automation really helps stream that together. Yeah, and like I think you guys you guys do a really good job at, uh, at explaining this as well. But that a lot of people will, um, like yeah, they'll have gaps in their detections they don't know about, and maybe it's that you know that type that like you know you're only detecting AES encryption, uh, like but what you'll notice when you're building the automation like a lot of people they'll describe their process and like we'll ask people you know what's your manual process all day every day but they'll describe their process and they'll have gone straight into like the really deep level like be like oh, i always like you know analyze headers in emails and you're like like cool and like that's that is like really, that's the sophisticated way of doing it but, like you, you haven't even told me that you analyze the links yet they're like oh no we don't really analyze the links it's like you like you you analyze the headers but you don't analyze the links like great but like you've missed like 50 things over here and yeah you have very much detected the much more sophisticated attack that this guy's doing over here but it's important to understand that there's like these things over here that can be uh can be detected as well and that can be responded to and that you you just may be missing if you're uh if you're only diving into like especially when you're like you're reading yeah you're reading your security blogs your security vendors uh when you're reading their processes they'll often go like really deep into the much more sophisticated and like latest attack techniques but they won't necessarily say by the way here's the, like the basic stuff that you should be uh, focusing on as well yeah we had we had a uh we do some like our red team does some work with customers to where they'll do like uh detection capability assessments to where uh they'll work with the the blue team or the SOC to basically run through a bunch of scenarios and then see you know are your detections working as you expect them to so it's kind of like validation but maybe more varied than like your automated validation type type stuff um and they they start they usually will start off with like you know something kind of like they they'll say okay we want to test our lateral movement uh detections and so they started off with something that was like nuanced like uh, wmi lateral movement or uh they were using like uh, ex something with Excel, like the Excel com object to do some lateral movement or something like kind of nuanced. And it was like a new, new thing at the time. Um, 
and they they the customer caught all that and then they're like okay well we're just going to go through this last one just to you know it's probably a shoe in like if you're catching all this other stuff guaranteed you're going to catch it and they use ps exec and uh the the customer like didn't even have a detection for ps exec so it's almost like sometimes we get too caught up in like the sexy that we don't do yeah. the, the fundamental i guess I, i've got this like and it's not it's not a like I, I think information security Twitter can be incredible. It can also be like a little bit toxic. But like, there's so many people that are doing it. Just, just a little so, bit toxic. No, a, a little, just a, just a little bit. But like, it, there's a lot of people sharing really like I- impressive knowledge, and like you've got you can learn a ton. And it's like if if you're if you're if you're there and you're you're participating, it's like it can be it can be like extremely valuable. I think you guys know that. Um, but there's also like this instagram influencer-esque like uh portion of it where like people are like sharing their photos or like they're sharing their like their war stories and these incredible detections they built and it forces the other people i think it, it gives them an unrealistic expectation of what they should a be looking for in their environment and be building detections for and be like what other teams are doing uh and like they will therefore be like, you know, they'll be able to detect these like really advanced techniques, but that's because they're the only things they focus on. Cause they're like, this is what I absolutely have to do. But I think, like, you know, I've, I've worked in some organizations. We've got some like really, yeah, we've got some incredible customers who are doing like incredibly sophisticated things, but there's, I think there's, there's an, a little bit of a, a misperception or a miscommunication between the sophisticated things people are doing and vendors are telling you that you should be doing and the actual reality on the ground in a lot of information security teams, even information security teams with like, you know, companies that are worth, you know, tens of billions of dollars where they're not doing a lot of things that you like it, that they're, they're, it's not that they're not doing things. They're just at an earlier step in their journey and they want to get there, but they think they should be like doing all these incredible things up here that in reality, like you, you have to, you know, walk before you can run and, uh, you have to build out those like basic detections before you build out the the really sexy ones. Well, I think I think also too when it comes to that, there's two points I want to hit. I really want to touch on that Instagram influencer Twitter thing because I, I like to be controversial sometimes. But like to go back a little bit there is one thing I I agree with 100 percent is focusing on the foundational things instead of like the more complex starting off is super important because um, right now I'm like somewhat building on a methodology for different types of bypasses, right? And one that we talk about a lot is comprehension bypass. And that's basically whenever you have an analyst that either doesn't have the technical skill set or the technical knowledge to determine or go through the process of say like, okay, how do I triage this alert or how do I determine it's bad? And that's not anything bad on the analyst per se, but a lot of times we see, okay, I want to go focus on, I don't know what's a good example here. Something like super high, like crazy, like, like the new, like, I did this when I first started working, like process reimaging came out probably two days, three days after I started working at Spectre Ops. And I'm like, oh God, this is awesome. Like this is on Twitter. Like I'm going to work on this. And then I realized I didn't have the foundational knowledge for process injection. And then I had to like, okay, well, I don't have the foundational knowledge for processes and threads. And then I have to like dive deeper into this rabbit hole, which is totally okay to do. But if you want to go through that process of a detection correctly, instead of just like making assumptions, you have to be willing to comprehend all of the information and knowledge that participates in that attack right and so that might take longer than maybe you would want but i think sometimes uh i don't know how to say this i don't want to say people get bored with the process or they get discouraged with the process but they're willing to take shortcuts in the informational piece of the detection that ends up hurting the organization bigger than they might realize sometimes i think that that reminds me of I may have talked about this on a previous episode, but we have a we had we had a training class that we built custom for a customer, and one of the things that we talked about were securable objects because we wanted to like we had this thing to where it's like, uh, to be a detection engineer or like a SOC analyst, these are some skill sets that would be valuable, and then it's like let's talk let's teach you some of the foundational concepts of those skill sets, and one of them is Windows internals, right, and. Uh, in order to understand how Windows functions, it's valuable to understand that there's these things called securable objects, right? So that would be like, for instance, a file is a securable object. Any any object that has a security descriptor is that's kind of the definition of a securable object. But a file, like any anything that you've ever tried to access and it says access is denied, that means that it's a securable object for, you know, that's probably a safe bet anyway. Um, and, and so we go through the securable objects and we talk about them. We talk about what DACLs are, discretionary access control lists. Those are what define who's able to access that and all that kind of stuff. 
And then, uh, and we talked about each of the different types, processes, threads, name pipes, um, services, all those things are securable objects, files, directories. Um, and it's kind of like, okay, well, you're teaching me, teaching me securable objects, but I don't really, it's kind of like when you're in math class as a kid and you're like, well, when am I ever going to, you know, use this? And they're like, well, just wait. And like, they never, you know, you felt you either got an example of where that would be useful practically. And you're like, okay, now I understand why I should learn this. Or they didn't give that to you. And you're kind of like, screw this. I don't want I don't want to waste my time on it. Um, but we were kind of at the screw this. I don't want to waste my time understanding securable objects. And then later on, we were talking about uh, credential dumping from LSAS. And one of the, one of the things that people had read was uh, that when you dump credentials from LSAS, you have to open a handle to LSAS, and then you have to. There's uh, in Sysmon even ID10. There's a granted process granted access uh, field, right? And so everybody's like, okay, well, I know that if the field is 1010, then that that's you know Mimi cats. Well, a that that's not true, right? There's tons of different false positives that could come from that. But also, uh, 1010 is kind of like the minimum viable product for accessing that securable object to do the things that you need to do. And that was an opportunity for us to be like. Hey, remember when we talked about securable objects? Well, this this LSAS, right, is a process and processes are securable objects. And the way that you access securable objects is you request a handle to them. And when you request a handle to them, you have to ask for specific access rights. And those access rights are what are that 1010 is representing, the hexadecimal 1010. And then like once we start and we talked about this, remember when we were talking about files, and we can start to like understand that well 1010 is one example like you know, these ex these access rights can be added to or taken away from, which means that there can be kind of like a, you know, a bunch of different combinations. Like some, I think I calculated it to be like a million different combinations of values that can represent at least 1010. Um, and so like, then you kind of like bring it all together and they're like, oh, well, it's good that I know that. Otherwise I would have just been, you know, blindly following this instruction online that said, hey, you should look for 1010 without understanding that maybe that was inherently flawed to begin with to some degree, right? See, that perfectly goes into exactly what I wanted to talk about. Oh, so, boy. Yeah, so here we go. So um, I think there's also, <laughs> I think, like, when it comes to that Twitter, Instagram influencer type of activity that happens a lot of times, um, although there are tremendously smart people in industry, I am always an advocate for don't trust anybody's work um, unless they actually give you a reason why or show you the process. Don't trust it blindly, basically. Don't trust it blindly, basically. And so oftentimes we might see on Twitter, uh, someone might like say, oh, I wrote a detection. Here's a detection for X. Here's all the false positives. Go ahead and just exclude those. And you don't hear why. You don't see the process. You don't see like any of the thought process that went behind that or any of the methodology. To me, that gets, um, there's been times where someone will call me and be like, yo, is this right? And I'm like, well, I mean, I might have not walked through that exact technique, but I would lean closer to don't trust that because I don't see any methodology here. I don't see any of the testing here. So it's like, to me, I don't trust that. And there's a lot of inherent trust that happens because people have X amount of Twitter followers. And although I'm not saying that their information isn't correct, I'm also a huge advocate for, I don't believe that fault. If there are any, they're very few, but I don't believe there's many false positives that are globally unique. I think most of them are going to be locally unique. And so just because you have, a false positive in X organization doesn't mean that's going to be the same false positive in your organization. And there should be zero trust between those two false positives because and a, the false positive is going to happen, in my opinion, by event data set only locally, not globally. And so like that's partially where those two things come in line, where I'm not a huge fan of people on Twitter saying, oh, X is a false positive of process injection. It's like, Yes, maybe for your instance, or maybe you've seen this a couple times in your research lab or in your organization, but what is the possibility of an attacker taking control of that binary and performing that exact same type of activity of what you can see from a data perspective? And now at this point, you've created an analytic bypass into your own organization, which is a wide open door for yeah. an attacker to walk through. Yeah, so it's, I guess, like, is is like a, a definitive statement so if you say this is a false positive that's very definitive you probably more accurately should say this can be or sometimes is a false positive but like yeah like you said an attacker could could take control of that binary or like do process hollowing or whatever and then you know act on its behalf and 
you know, you got to determine whether that's, you know, something that you're willing to accept as far as risk, right? Your, what's your risk tolerance for that type of activity? It's it's the difference between alert, alert and detection as well. Like your your detection can't really be a false positive or a you know a, a false negative. Your your alert could be a false positive, uh, or a false negative or a true positive. But it's also like it's it's the case across like the entire organization that like even even within one organization, an alert can be like a false. Like you see this all the time. Like alerts can be you know uh, can be false positives if they're triggered by one user, but like totally like totally true and worthy of spinning up an incident if it's triggered by another user like you know if you if you detect like the, 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 this is it's kind of automation can be used at this uh, this sort of instance as well but like the like lower like traditionally lower fidelity detections like your partial encoded command or something like that like they're you know terrible to like the, you just can't enable them across an entire organization because you're just going to get like tons and tons of uh of false positives but if you're able to like couple that with some information about a user uh, like a user who's like you know in your product development work or in devops who's got like you know a uh partial encoded command like probably going to happen several times a day if you've got somebody in your sales team and you work in i don't know or like customer support and you work in a in a regular tech company or you work in like a, a in a SaaS company and they run partial encoded command something's gone seriously wrong there and you guys need to investigate that immediately so that like the context of an alert it's not just yeah. It's not just um yeah. It's not just going to be like whether that detection is really good. It's like gathering as much context, or a yeah. detection can be like can be made much more useful with the context of who's running it and after you enrich it as well. Man, yeah. So like, that's that's interesting because sorry to make you off, Jared, but uh, but like, it's interesting because that just correlates to, in my opinion, I think the a majority of detections out there they're combining detection and triage into the same query. Yeah. And then that in itself has so many issues that are just combined within it. Um, and so it's like, to me, whenever a data set fires or an alert fires from just like the base condition, I mean, it's successfully fired. Who's to say it's an actual false positive yet? We don't know because we haven't seen the contextual pieces of data yet. Right. Like, I don't know yet. And so like that, that feeds into, okay, well, if you're trying to filter those out from the get go, well, you're vastly limit limiting yourself and then the next question is if you do break out those two processes whenever an analyst walks in there are they going to look at that alert or is their first goal to like look at the alert and say how do i figure out this is malicious how do i figure out this is good or how do i just pull general information at first to then make a decision later like what i've always been so curious about this from analyst to analyst like what is their actual thought process when they first look at an alert is it Oh, I'm rushed on time. I got to determine if this is non-malicious or benign ASAP, or I'm really wanting to show that this is malicious, or I'm just trying to pull general information now and I'll look at it all later and then make a decision whenever I see all the pieces of the pie in front of me. Like I've been so curious about that. And each analyst I've talked to has been different. Like it's so interesting to me. And, and yeah, and it, like a lot of the time, it'll depend on the alert, and it'll depend on their first reaction of like spidey senses of like, oh, I think I remember something to do with that user, or like that organization has done something like that before. Therefore, I need to like you know now I you, they go in with the impression that this is a malicious alert, and therefore they'll like you know spend much more time digging in to try to figure it out, or they'll go in and be like, ah oh, no, that's just you know, uh, whatever Jessica she works in, uh, I, I remember something seen about something to her before. And then they'll go in with the impression that this is uh that this is benign. So it's really uh yeah, it's really it's a really, really interesting process. But if you're able to like get that information and make it give it to them to make so that they're able to and so it's coming in a little bit more neutral, it'll uh it'll help massively. Yeah, so. I was so what I was gonna say is uh there's a really good opportunity with PowerShell encoded commands that like and this is this is kind of what Johnny's getting at is in order for something to be a false positive, you have to have classified it first, right? Um and classification, like he said, sometimes is uh, correlated with detection, I guess, or like they're they're mixed together when maybe they shouldn't be. But like, if you're worried about malicious PowerShell, or like if you're worried about PowerShell encoded commands being used, then like the first step is to identify all PowerShell encoded commands. Now, identification and alerting are not necessarily the same thing, right? But like. You, you need to identify them. You need to have a way to consistently identify every PowerShell encoded command. Because if, if you know, Daniel Bohannon comes out with obfuscation and is able to bypass your ability to identify his encoded command, then it doesn't matter how good your detection is because you're not even going to see it at the in the first place, right? So, um, so, okay, first we want to identify 
every PowerShell encoded command. Then we want to classify, right? So how do you differentiate one PowerShell encoded command from the other? Well, the way that you, you would do that probably is to, you know, unencode or decode it, right? So it's base64, you would base64 decode it. Well, that's probably something that your security automation tool could do, right? So basically like pass in every encoded command that ever happens into, into your security automation tool, decode it, and then maybe you have something like look for file pass. If it has a file path in it, then you would have a separate routine that would go and download that file, right? And then provide it to the analyst. Or uh, if maybe you look for specific like .NET calls um, that that you might be interested in, right? So, but, and then you produce an, an alert on the other side that says like, this goes into like, you said that you, you have a difference of opinion, but ultimately you like everything can't, unless you have explicitly identified something as benign, everything can be malicious, right? And then you're providing a score which is inherently flawed based on your understanding of the problem, right? Um, and so like, just because something gets a zero score doesn't mean that it's not malicious. It just means that you you don't know about the thing that makes it malicious potentially, right? Um, and, and so like, when you produce an alert, your alert is really just, there's some arbitrary threshold of score that you say, okay, well, if it's above this, and like, even if you're not scoring it, this is what's happening implicitly, right? So like, it doesn't matter if you are explicitly saying, if it's over 70, then we're going to alert. It could just be, we've just, we've decided that if it meets X and Y, then we're going to alert, right? That just, that's, it's the same thing, right? So you create an arbitrary threshold that says, we're going to alert above this. Um, and that, that's, that's your classification. Now you get to determine during your triage or investigation that it's a false positive, a false negative, true positive, true negative, right? Uh, from there. Uh, but yeah, I, I think, I think that, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on why, if something's a low threshold now, like that's assuming that you've established low, medium and high thresholds, why you might not be interested in things that are low threshold. I, I don't think I'm not interested in, in things that are low threshold. I think it's more that we can enrich things with like, with low thresholds kind of as you described. So like you okay. can decode that, you can decode that. Uh, it's I, Yeah, maybe I didn't explain myself earlier, but like sure. you can decode that base 64 uh, in like encoded string really easily and pass that through to the analyst. Or you can check, hey, did that process have any network connections? Because if, if that process had any network connections, then like that's probably a little bit more suspicious, you know, partial go to command with network connections. Or did it launch command at IZ or did it launch well, whatever? Uh, and if it did, then like, let's Let's look at those uh like let's look at the arguments that were passed and let's look at those network connections or let's look at the parent process because if it's word launching like you know powershell encoded command you better believe you've got something uh that's going wrong there but if it's you know chocolatey that just means somebody installed a crappy packet manager and they probably shouldn't have and you should probably ding them but you should probably shouldn't do anything else yeah so i guess it's that I, I guess what i'm more saying is that like we do a in information security right now i think we do it we get rid of those detections possibly a little bit too early. Whereas yeah. you can you can do a lot with that by like basically yeah enriching or correlating and getting like gathering that extra contextual information and passing it through to the analyst. One right. of the things that like we 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 see people do and I, I think you guys had a like had a conversation uh a, quite a big conversation about about this um with your guest from Palantir uh uh where you were talking about like chat ops but we see this like happening all the time with like just lowering that like lowering the the bar for detection so that it's totally okay to have a chatty detection if you can contact a user and say hey do you remember running partial encoded command and, like that's probably not the best but like you can definitely say hey do you remember at this time did you run like did you run PowerShell and like it was something to do with like like you know it, it it like it was launched with a process? If that person is like and you can contact them on Slack and ask them that information, have a nice pop up. If if they say I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about, that's now a really really good detection. Yeah. Uh, but if they say I yeah I know exactly what you're talking about, I was like you don't even care what their answer is. If they say yeah I know exactly what you're talking about, you're like yeah this is a this is absolutely fine. I can I can ignore it. But like we see people do this all the time and I, I think that there's like there's a lots of really useful detections like the, the and again like full credit goes that this isn't event by times or anything like that like dropbox had a really good uh like started this process and the slack team have like really some really cool um yeah really cool ideas around this but like our customers have gone like to the like, just like the nth degree with this where like if somebody you know exports a thousand rows from salesforce 
Like they can contact them and say, hey, you just exported a thousand rows from Salesforce. And they've got a detection that like, it's not even a detection. People download a thousand rows from Salesforce like all the time. But what you're doing now is you're doing, you've got, you've got a detection there because you're able to contact them and say, hey, was this you? Uh, you're detecting your like your emotets and your tr like trick bots and your hand sitters, those guys who will go in and if you've got an active connection to Salesforce, they will dump your entire database. Like you're detecting that straight away. So it's just like another like a little bit further on the kill chain. But the other thing you're doing there is you're enforcing really good security hygiene in your environment in a way that like is actually genuinely probably more impressive for like a an end result for the security of your company than like being able to build a detection for an apt who's just gonna yep. like who may very well compromise you anyway but if you're able to tell your security and use like your end users hey like you just downloaded a thousand rows you probably shouldn't have or you've just downloaded you know fifty thousand rows and it contains email addresses this breaks all processes and you do that like 10 minutes after they've done that and maybe you know ping their manager if they don't respond all that sort of stuff you're now like you're basically just getting a much safer environment for your entire team and it's cost you as a security like the security nothing. team like absolutely nothing like yep. you've, you've done nothing the only thing you did was those logs that were sitting around so that when you got breached you could go through and investigate what's happened you've now put them to really good use you've got some pretty good good quality detections and you've uh yeah and, and you've like in, improved the security hygiene of your uh, of your entire company yeah and an interesting I, interesting aspect of that like crowdsourcing kind of approach is yeah. just because they say no i didn't i didn't run <laughs> yeah, yeah, powershell yeah. encoded command doesn't mean that it's bad right because uh especially yeah. like the less technical the the, end, the user that you're asking the the more likely this is to happen but there even like i'm i think i know a lot about how computers work uh but there's a lot of stuff happening in the background that i'm not explicitly aware of right so like my user may be doing something because I'm running some software or something uh, that I'm not aware of. But I think the point still stands. Like if I know that I did it, then you probably like either I'm a bad actor, like I'm an insider in the first place. Uh, but yep. that's not really what you're looking for in this case. Um, either I'm an insider or it's something legit. Right. Um, or, you know, whatever. It's mm -hmm. OK. Generally OK. Um, but if I don't know about it, it's either it's either bad or it's something that we should probably be aware of explicitly that's happening anyway. So like we should, tr we should spend the time to track it down regardless. And you know what? Like, it's so easy to just like deduplicate as well. Like yep. if you, like, if you get that again, like all you need to do is be like, okay, show me for the same hash on the same computer for the same username, like with the same parent process, just don't yep. show me that alert again. Like, yep. and now you've, you've gone through the process and you're like, okay, that's never going to fire again for that particular alert, yep. which is like, which is great. And you know, you, you, you now no, no longer need to worry about that. Yep. It's kind of, uh, I've definitely experienced that, like the, you know, the user, I th think if, yeah, if you're, if you're, if you've been in response for, I don't know if you'll definitely have contacted a user and said, Hey, do you remember clicking on this link? And they're like, Nope. It's like, you visited the page. Like, I may have visited, I may have visited the page. It's like, um, do you remember entering credentials? And they're like, Nope. It's like, I can see a post request in your logs to this particular page. And they're like, I may have entered some credentials. You're like, okay. We're going to need to reset your, uh, we're going to need to reset your account. <laughs> so deny, deny, like, deny, deny, deny. Yeah. yeah. But, but there's another aspect that like this, like the, this chat offs and this automation can like really bring in, which is like, it's like contacting those users, but providing them with like really good experiences. So like there's in information security right now, I feel that like nobody has good experience, like not nobody, but like there's very few experiences where you're able to like get wins and share them with the company or share them with the team and like give people like a, Hey, like, thanks so much for reporting. And like if somebody reports a phishing email, like being able to say like, thanks for reporting, like that's great. But the other aspect of like being able to go back to a user and say, hey, you actually saved like us X, Y, and Z. It's yeah, I, I got a cool a, a, a cool story that like this this happened in my this happened in DocuSign where um we had a it's always dangerous telling war stories because you're like not sure what you're allowed to to tell. But I think this is absolutely uh this is absolutely fine. We had a we we had a um somebody reported a phishing email, an executive assistant reported a phishing email and said, Hey, I got this weird phishing email. And we were like, Oh, thanks for reporting. I uh, appreciate it. And just took a look at it. We're like, yeah, it's a, this is potentially interesting. Like, you know, executive assistant getting a phishing email could be targeted. And we looked through our logs to see, um, did anybody click on the link? And we're like, Oh shit, three people clicked on the link. And we contacted those guys on, uh, like our internal messaging system. And we're like, Hey, did you, uh, did you like enter any credentials? And two of them had entered credentials. And we're like, okay, immediately reset those passwords. And we look at their user accounts and we're like, 
oh crap like these are like these three people that clicked on the link they're all also executive assistants right this is like this is potentially like a really targeted attack and um, so we then look to see everybody else who visited that um so you received that mail there are like eight people who received the mail we contact them on uh like on our internal messaging system and say hey you remember receiving this mail and they're like like don't click on it and don't click it on your mobile etc and one of them's like oh yeah that's uh that's actually the um you know that's actually the uh restaurant just down the road that we really like booking for all the execs and we're like what and yeah so it turns out that just like a, a fancy restaurant just down the road from our like san francisco head headquarters was compromised and it was just like a, a standard like credential page and it was just like completely opportunistic but these completely opportunistic like attackers had compromised two executive assistants who had access to two executive or like two like c-level staffs and mailboxes and i we got in there and we detect like we isolated those accounts we weren't like uh and like we detected some suspicious logins later that were like that failed but it was that process of that one person reporting and us being able to respond really well and detect those and lock those accounts that actually saved us from like what would have just been an incredibly embarrassing like p1 incident with potential like discovery and potential disclosure and impl disclosure implications which you never want to have to do yeah but with this like with like that like it's really cool and that like the person that reported it deserves a huge amount of credit because they did but like with this with the automation you're able to like say thanks for reporting by the way you also save like these three or four or ten people and like you proactively helped your entire company it's just a much nicer just a really nice like win that you're able to share with you know with everybody and security as a like as a team comes out looking kind of like rock stars as a result it's great yeah yeah so. johnny you yeah. had something i think you started to i was talk. trying yeah i'm currently trying to remember what that was because you said something that really intrigued me and i can't remember what it was now no uh, yeah so i'm sure it'll come back rip yeah my bad yeah, so, yeah, I think I, I oh, think what's ahead. really cool, I think what's really cool about that process is like, I mean, oftentimes, like, I mean, I'm an infosec, and I think one of my like least favorite things to do is to take like security trainings from clients, just because they're boring and they just absolutely suck in general. Um, I don't know if that's the right term, but yeah, they kind of suck. And so it's like you kind of just like get like this inherent like, you don't really get to communicate with the security team. You're like, what do they really do? Well, I think that process kind of bridges that, right? And it makes it kind of bring the company together as a whole, which makes people kind of more excited about security, which I mean, the reality, the, the more people are excited about security in an organization, the, the more aware they are to identify things that are just kind of off the wall and off the charts kind of weird. Um, I remember what I was going to talk about now. Okay, boom. Yeah, so when it comes, I'm curious your thoughts on this, on... Um, when it comes to like automation in general, how many times in cl in client environments have you seen um, clients trying to enrich like really complex pieces of data, but they don't have like the foundational data there? Like what I'm looking for is like maybe like EDR process based data and like Windows security events, but like they really want to focus on like ETW or they want to focus on really complex pieces like that. Have you seen that a lot inside your environment? Like, so like some, uh, we've got customers ranging from like four, four person teams all the way up to like fortune tens. So like with 160,000 people. So we've seen pretty much everything, but yeah, what you will see, and it's kind of like surprising sometimes is you will see people that like, will have like, a, you know, uh, they'll come, they'll come to you and they'll say like, Hey, you know, I'm looking at automating and like, you've, I've got this process. They're like, okay, cool. What are you like, you know, where are you storing your logs? They're like, oh, we don't have a SIM. They're like, okay. And like, where are you, you know, doing like, you know, what are you detecting from? Like, you know, do you guys have like, you know, how are you able to detect this? Like, we don't have an EDR either. And you're like, oh, okay. And it's, it's really like, I think, I think it's, there's a lot of people that are yeah, a lot further down that maturity model than I think like we care to uh we like we care to admit. So that even those folks that do have a sim, they're not like it and again, it's like the improvement that you can probably get in your detections from bringing in uh like be able to like collect Windows event logs or being able to expand what you're like the logs that you're collecting, it's probably gonna be more effective. Uh, like ex like spending time with your security infrastructure team collecting additional logs from additional tools or additional services uh, or expanding like yeah I, like I'm not going to say like put system on everywhere that's going to be a pain in the ass but like getting your EDR logs or built like deploying EDR is probably going to be more effective in terms of like defending your organization uh, than it is going down yeah building out building out much more sophistications using uh, using the tools that you have but yeah we do see people that are 
that would be trying to enrich without like having some fundamentals there. I think though most people that are it's not everybody, but most people that are invest, investing in automation, they know the time and place that they think they should be doing it. So most of the time, like if you're building, if you're starting from scratch, it does make sense to like start automating at the very start because you're able to like build out a process where you've got this modular component that building out a detection is really easy. And it doesn't matter where you're plugging it in from. It's always going to your case management. It's always enriching all these areas. However, like it... Like I'm not selling psycho. Like it, it's like it probably shouldn't be the very first thing on your on your list, uh, unless you are purchasing these other tools at the same time, or else you unless you have like got a process in place to collect all these other logs. Because otherwise, you're automating a process where you don't have a process in place to automate it in the first place. So yeah. that's yeah. not a that's not automating process. That's just like throwing some uh, that's you know just getting some alerts and and putting them into a case management yeah. system. Yeah. One one thing that really intrigues me is like I think oftentimes we see. Or I've talked to people who are like, oh, like, what does ETW say? Which I think ETW is a phenomenal telemetry source, right? But mm -hmm. what I think is interesting is oftentimes I think we see people that want to run before they can crawl in terms of telemetry. Yeah. It's like you have, like, these telemetry sources right now, and they're not you're not using them to the full capacity, right? So you could have additional coverage and additional insight into an actual activity or an actual event. You're just not leveraging it. And now you want to bring in another telemetry source to see something kind of similar to that right and i think that kind of like correlates like i did some rpc research a long time ago it's like, okay it's like you have rpc like information when it comes to etw but then you also if you pull like a lot of edr products will show you the network communication events so that will kind of get you somewhat there for the rpc and then like windows security events have their own rpc kind of undercover event as well i mean it's not rpc specific that's another topic but like it uses like wfp windows filtering platform but it's like built upon rpc so it's like if we understand our telemetry more in depth then I think we would have a better visibility um, and coverage and insight into specific activity versus um, having to bring in all the tooling in the world in order to see like the same thing that something else might see. You just have to dig for it a little bit more. Yeah, uh, yeah, I completely agree with that. I think that I think that I think that makes a ton of like a ton of sense. Uh, I think a lot of people though, again, like they they're not gonna they're not gonna have that like sophistication level to know how to do that. But they're also gonna like some especially like your one man security teams or two man security teams, they're kind of struggling with like, you know, just knowing what to do in general. And they're, they will be so like, there's, there's a huge amount of money put into like marketing or like all these incredible information security products. And they'll be told like, Hey, this is like where you need to spend your money. And they will like much rather purchase a tool that like gets them 50% of the way there rather than tune everything and have to like do the, do the thing, like do those steps manually. But yeah, you're totally right. There's a lot of people that aren't like nearly leveraging the, the resources they have. Uh, enough that they could get a lot um yeah they could get a lot further with what the with what they have um and and, the, and like there's just a and like the soft skills as well are underrated it's not just what you have it's like you know partnering with like it's quite possible that you already have like you know uh like a collector on your like that your your whatever product your in your production environment your product development team have already sold and sold collectors that are like collecting all these logs anyway somewhere else like you may very well be able to like use your soft skills to leverage your relationship to just collect some other events and like pump those into into sim or into your splunk um and build out detections that way rather than trying to yeah, deploy some other tool or do some work yourself so one thing that uh you guys kind of led to that i think is an interesting topic is uh this idea of like trying to run before you walk right so like Mm -hmm. basically not aligning your approach with the maturity that you inherently have. Um, and like one of the places that I see this, uh, this is a, kind of like an interesting paradox, right? So um, we have a lot of clients that might not be creating, they might not do detection engineering. So they're not creating their own custom detections. They're just using uh, kind of like out of the box vendor detections. Yeah. And a lot of times they start off with uh, like, UBA, like user behavioral analytics, right? Um, type of stuff. So it's all um, like trying to look at anomaly based detections and, and things like that. And the, the, the cool thing about that is that that relieves the burden of detection itself a lot, right? Because it like you just plug it in and it's going to collect some information. It's going to spit out, hey, this is an interesting thing. Hey, this is an interesting thing. The problem is, is that uh, it's not very targeted, right? So like if I write a detection that says I'm looking for uh, the malicious creation of a service for lateral movement purposes, that's like very like, and then I produce an alert from that. 
it's like a very specific thing that now my goal as the analyst is like the triage or investigation analyst is to say, okay, well, is this thing a service that's being used for lateral movement, right? That, that scopes it down quite a bit for the investigation. But if, uh, if you have this, you know, and I'm kind of being hyperbolic to some degree, if you have like this behavioral analytics platform that just says, Hey, this is interesting. You should look at it. Or this is anomalous. You don't have a scope. So now, now your responsibility on investigation is to prove that it's not bad, right? It's really freaking hard to prove that something's not bad as opposed to prove that something is not a service that's being used for lateral movement, for instance. Um, and I think, I think basically people shoot themselves in the foot, uh, because they, they don't want the burden of detection, but what they don't realize is that they've created a massive burden on investigation, right? So like, it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, like the laws of thermodynamics, right? The burden is there regardless of how you go about it. It's just, you know, what side of detection and investigation do you want the burden to be on? And I think uh, people don't understand that. And like, there's so many platforms that will tell you that they can like detect absolutely everything. I can't like, like, you know, each their own with, with different like EDR platforms, sure. but like your, 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 like use your behavior analysis or like your, like I call them, like they, they claim they're silver bullets, but like we say they're like, they're black boxes that are actually just shaped like a silver bullet, but like your silences of the world where they'll say like, we detect, we don't rely on any signatures at all. We just like detect bad using like mach machine learning. You're like, that's great. But like, I have no idea how your like neural network works to pick this up. You just detected something bad and some anomaly. And now I have to go and investigate these like 20 different steps. But I don't, the only context I have is you detected that this is unusual for this particular user. Yeah, that's correct. nearly that's nearly impossible for me to uh to investigate and you're right it is unusual for this particular user but that doesn't mean it's bad or good it just means that it's unusual for this particular user and um, they, they they my my favorite phrase from that was we were this is a while back we were talking with somebody from uh from uh from silence and we kind of bemoaned their like their the number of false positives they had and they're like oh no no we don't we don't we don't have false positives uh, we just have like benign anomalies I was like, what? like, I don't even know what that means. Like, it's just your, that's just another definition of a false positive. Yeah. But they, yeah, they, they, they just make it impossible to, uh, possible to detect. But yeah, you're right. If you're able to, if you build those detections yourself, you were able to provide your analyst with, Hey, this is the exact reason, or your analyst knows the exact reason that it's, um, that it's like, that it's bad. Yeah. But I do think that like, there's a lot of people that, yeah, that like can still get a huge amount of value out of those like out of those detections if they're like if they're sophisticated enough. Yeah, uh, yeah, to, and that's yeah. and that's the thing is like, it's really so. There's two problems with the behavioral analytics. Well, maybe more than that, but one one is it's impossible to quantify your coverage, right? So like if somebody were to say, "How well does this protect us?" You have literally like nobody can honestly answer that. First of all, and then second, the second problem is um, you. It's really hard to actually investigate right so you've like you know you've kind of like forgotten about the right hand um in favor of the left hand i guess but um yeah i think it's it's one of those things that becomes really valuable for if you have the base so like the way that i think about it is like you should start off with like very precise indicators right so if you're very immature just write a bunch of precise indicators that are based off of like threat intel feeds that say if if you ever see this hash it's bad 100 percent of the time because the detection, the burden of detection is very low and the burden of investigation is very low because it's, you know, if it's hash based, it's like, A, I didn't, I didn't derive that that hash is bad in the first place. So there's a little bit of trust from whoever provided that to me in the first place. But like the detection burden was zero because I just took the hash and plugged it into whatever. And then the, the investigation burden is like, if it's this hash, then I know for a fact that it's that thing that I should be worried about. Right. So there's no investigation either. And then like, obviously there's huge gaps in that, right? So like, that's not the end all be all. Then you go into like kind of technique based detection, which is where you're saying, I have this very specific goal and this is my solution for solving that. And it's going to have some false positives, but when you receive an alert from it, these are the steps that you should take, whether automated or manually to try to investigate whether, whether it's bad or not. Right. And then like, and I'm probably simplifying a little bit, but then the next step is behavioral analytics, which is I can't even comprehend what I should be worried about. Um, but hopefully whatever that thing is that I don't know about is going to be, you know, anomalous or like unique in some way. And so like, I'm just going to capture unique things and then try to investigate those. But like, if you're not doing the, the first step, which is like detect, detect the default version of Mimikatz, if it ever, yeah, yeah. you know, gets created on disc, then like, you're probably messing up. 
like a hundred percent and you, you you're kind of like you're it's, it's kind of funny like you're describing your pyramid of pain there right like yeah. and you just like go you're just going up the, the levels in your pyramid of pain but like you don't really think about like when you're doing your pyramids the pyramid of pain like the pain and response and i think that like like you guys are obviously like the you know very focused on the detection but like the response piece is what like frustrate the hell out of everybody oh, yeah. and it's like you, you're you're totally right that like you know a threat feed is a brilliant way of like creating alerts that if they fire you've got it like a huge amount of context but like point me to like any free thread feed that you get like you know th it'll have like 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 .8 yeah, there yeah. at some point and like at that point you're like okay well now i've got like 50 alerts and you know or it'll have like a tor ip and it actually just turns out to be an ntp server for a university in germany or something like that and all of a sudden you're like what like why why am i like why is this machine reaching out at this particular time and you're causing yourself a huge amount of pain in the response process even though the detection was really like was really easy and over you know later on if you do detect that like yeah you know the somebody that hasn't changed uh, a single byte of mimi cats um then like you've got a good uh you've got a good detection but yeah you're not really thinking about the response but like yeah it's like ironically it's even worse if you've gone all the way up to like yeah advanced like you know behavioral analytics where like you're just thrown throwing something over the wall and you're not even told like this is supposed to be like a malicious IP address. You're just told this is unusual. That's yep. yeah, it's impossible. Well, that's like uh yeah, so I have uh we have this idea of the called the funnel of fidelity. That that was kind of the name was to play off of the pyramid of pain, right? But it's kind of a different yeah. focus. But it's it's my mental model for how I look at detection and response responsibilities, right? So the first step is collection. How do I know what's happening uh, in my environment, right? Through logging and all that kind of stuff. Detection, which is how do I identify things that I should be worried about or like that I should be interested in. Triage, which is how do I gather the additional context for those things that I identified in detection? And then how do I score them or like prioritize them? Uh, investigation. How do I validate whether or not those things are in fact bad? Um, and then remediation, which is how do I clean it up? And the the fundamental like precept of the funnel of fidelity is that you can do everything right, but if you miss one step, you're screwed, right? So like you could be great at detection and then triage and investigation, but if you don't know how to remediate it, you're screwed. But like a behavioral analytic, you're like, okay, well detection I'm good at because you know the behavioral analytic is just handling that. But like, I have no idea how to investigate it. And so like, it's cool that you identified something's anomalous, but like, you're going to fall down on the investigation phase very frequently. But like, similarly, you could be really great. And this is, this is where you got to be careful. Like if you're taking a training class that says, and like, granted, a training class is only a week long, so they can only teach you a subset of things. But like, there is an inherent flaw in a training class that says, hey, you were notified that this thing is bad. And now you need to investigate it. And when I say inherent flaw, it's probably purposeful, right? So like, don't, don't get me wrong, but like, it's only part of the problem because like, how did you know that that thing was bad in the first place? Well, there's the detection aspect. If we break it down really, really simply, there's detection and there's re response, right? And so detection is, Hey, I'm, I should be interested in this bad thing that's happening. And then response is I need to, you know, validate that it's bad and clean it up. Um, and generally like we teach a class that's focused on the detection aspect of that. And then there's other classes out there that focus on the, uh, remediation as, or the response aspect, right. But like a good program, like a good detection and response program should have at least individuals that are competent on both sides of that. Um, and like, maybe you outsource some aspect of either of those. So like, maybe you, maybe you're not competent in response. And so you get an IR retainer. Or maybe you're not competent in detection, and so you get um, you get like an EDR that has a bunch of built-in built-in alerts. the The thing is, is you know you get you get kind of like the amount of investment that you put into something is what you're gonna gonna get, right? So like if if you're limiting yourself to saying we're only going to use the detections that we get from our EDR vendor, um, then you know it's you're you're going to be very static, right? Because you're only going to grow when they decide that you can grow. Um, and generally speaking, as you mature. You're going to want to you're going to want to break away from that static kind of detection set i guess like you want to you want to complement that with your own uh creation i guess yeah 100 percent. i think um like kind of piggybacking on that i think that like there's certain like 
the people that are or the organizations that will claim that they can do absolutely everything or they claim they can detect absolutely everything are paradoxically those ones that probably aren't good at anything it's like your jack of all trades so like if you're looking for a incredible like like the, the edwar is probably not the best example an incredible thread intel company like it's probably best to focus on those guys that are like like grain noise, like just laser focus on one area of threat intel and say so like, hey, we're really good at this and then we'll be able to get a really solid feeder. If you're looking for, yeah, somebody who's, you know, to analyze, yeah, analyze fish, like uh, URLs or something like that. If you're able to find those people that are just really good at like that one particular area, you're going to be able to get a, um, you'll be able to get, yeah, get, get higher fidelity from that. But if you've got somebody who says they can do everything or like use yeah, behavior analysis to solve all these problems, and like we you know detect bad just in general ironically they're not going to be like nearly as good at any of those they're just going to be a little bit like they're just going to be more painful and maybe they will detect like some at each stage of the process but they're definitely not going to be anywhere near as deep in any stages of that process yeah. and that's where you're you're gonna yeah you're gonna really struggle we're really yeah we're we're yeah i, I think that's a it's, it's it's just true in uh, in most companies in general. If they're focused on fifty different things, they're they're not going to be great at, at all of them. Agreed, completely agreed. Cool. Well, we really appreciate you joining the podcast, and uh, hopefully, we can do this again soon. There's a lot of great conversation. I'm really excited for the audience to hear a lot of this. Um, again, this you provided a lot of perspective into the automation piece and all those things that like we don't get to see from day to day. So we really appreciate you coming in and doing that for us. Wait, wait. thank you it's been an absolute pleasure um and yeah I've, re I've really enjoyed the conversation i've really enjoyed like listening to your podcasts and um yeah meeting you guys so thanks for having me on awesome yeah we yeah, really nice enjoyed learning how uh how big of fans you guys were and we appreciate you guys reaching out to uh <laughs> to be on the podcast and congrats on your i guess series b today question mark yeah yeah that's uh so that that just dropped uh that just dropped earlier today yeah so uh just a, just for, a few million just it. like a couple just yeah just uh, just a couple <laughs> which will, yeah ho hopefully uh hopefully like well like it's yeah thanks for that thanks for sharing <laughs> uh, uh kind of put me on the spot and i should also by the way like ma major shout out to, to john on uh on uh the team uh with the two johns on the team one who like was like hey you, everybody in the company you've got to listen to uh got to listen to this literally there was an announcement in general in our slack saying everybody listen to this podcast and then other john uh, who kind of got in touch and organized everything but yeah we just raised the series b um uh so we got an investment from uh a vc company called addition and then backing from some additional uh some of some other investors who've supported us in the past and then also support from uh from crowdstrike and some silicon valley uh CISO, CISO network um, which is really exciting but yeah we're just going to be like uh, using it to expand like and improve our product and um, so we're doubling down on uh on security automation and yeah making our customer like m making the platform more effective for all of our customers so yeah we're really excited but thanks for uh thanks for noticing i didn't i didn't mention it at all during and i was like let's try to keep this uh as <laughs> non uh, as non snake oil as possible so no, no, no i just like, coming from like a background of working exclusively for startups i know how much of a big deal that is so yeah, congratulations again, and we are really appreciate you stopping well, by. Well, it's worth it's worth noting before we leave that you do have a free version of the product. So if somebody yeah. if somebody doesn't necessarily have like the support from their company or they want to build a proof of concept to show how security automation can be utilized, they can do that through Tines, right? And also, there's a yeah. Slack. There's a Slack as well that you get to have access to. So we can do a little bit of shilling here. It's fine. Yeah. I mean, like it's yeah, not yeah. a big deal. So it, the fact yeah, that you you're a little, the fact that you're hard. a little embarrassed about it is that's good. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So like, yeah, there, there's, there's a free version. It's actually pretty generous. So you can, uh, you can like implement uh, like a hundred actions. So basically you can like automate it several different processes, probably like, you know, a need your process and maybe a, a basic enough fishing process and, and maybe an, a guard duty alerts process in there, which is, uh, which is really cool. Um, and yeah, we've got a Slack where you can ask us as many questions as you want, just times.io slash Slack, you can sign up. Um, but yeah, really just try it, the community edition, ping us on Slack if you have any questions at all, we're more than happy to, to answer. And yeah, like we're like, the vast majority of that, uh, certainly all of my team and the vast majority of like the, the team have like InfoSec backgrounds. So we're, we're more than happy to like to dive in and like, like help out and just like help out engineers. We're not trying to, yeah, like just, uh, yeah, sell you something that we don't think works. We're trying to build a product that we wished we had when we were, uh, when we were like in your shoes. And yeah, we've got some really happy customers who will tell you that it works really well. So awesome. Cool. Yeah, man. Awesome. Thanks again. again thank, you, thank you. 
Thank you so much, guys. It was a pleasure. Cheers. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Detection Challenging Paradigms. If you want to keep up with us, you can do so on Twitter at DCP the Podcast or on our website, dcppodcast.com. Every week, you'll see posts about who our next guest is going to be, the actual episode announcements themselves, and on our website, you can see all the episodes listed with links to the different podcast providers and our timing guides. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.